Good evening, I'm Bob Whitten along with Larry Camp. And on the top of the news tonight, California got some snow and some rain. And the California legislature opened its new session, but they have nothing on us. So we'll report the rest of the news, sports and weather, as TV40 reports the new news at 10 o'clock next. I took it to Best Auto Painting. I heard they did good work, but I never expected anything like this. I could hardly believe it was the same car. Best Auto Painting can't guarantee results like this all the time, but if you want professional paint and body work at best prices, see your nearby Best Auto Paint shop. A quick, simple way to preserve fresh garden vegetables is by freezing. But first, heat or blanch them in boiling water to keep the enzymes from causing a loss of flavor extension service. When a healthy person suddenly becomes a medical case history, you'll see courage, compassion, helpless frustration, and sometimes blind rage. The man is a marvelous doctor, Steve, but it's the doctor a marvelous man, Mark. Starting this coming Monday, Marcus Welby, 7 o'clock Monday through Friday. TV40 10 o'clock news with Bob Whitten and Larry Kapp, Maggie Scora Weather, and Ken Gimlin Sports. Presented in part as one of the many services of Sacramento Savings, a longtime friend of the family for savings and loans. Good evening. Here's what's happening. The 120 members of the California legislature returned to work today, officially opening the 1977-78 session. Our Capitol correspondent Ron Abernathy was on hand at the state capitol as the gavel was sounded in both houses. It wasn't exactly a formal opening, but California lawmakers returned to their desks today to officially begin the 1977-78 session. A host of controversial issues, from school financing to the death penalty, are on the agenda. In the assembly, a short morning session allowed the introduction of several measures, but eyes were primarily focused on Speaker Leo McCarthy, one of the most powerful men in the legislature. The San Francisco Democrat expressed hope that Governor Brown's plan to give Californians both court-acceptable school financing and property tax relief would be a reality. He predicted that the surplus in the governor's budget message next week will be good news, but perhaps not enough to avoid raising some taxes somewhere along the line. Over in the upper house, the Senate chaplain helped open the new session with an appropriate prayer. O oh Lord our God, if ever we needed thy wisdom and thy guidance, it is now. As the Senate of the State of California begins a new session, standing upon the threshold of a new year, fraught with so many dangerous opportunities, we pray that you will bless these senators chosen by the people of this state, for thou knowest them, their needs, their motives, their hopes, and their fears. For state senators, it was a routine session today. Even the new chairman of the powerful Finance Committee, Sacramento Democrat Albert Rada, retained his back row desk. There was one unique addition, the state's first female senator, Democrat Roseanne Vuich of Dinuba. Most of the upper chamber's opening session was filled with resolutions and memorials to former senators who've gone on to either bigger offices or out of politics. Tomorrow, both houses will be busy with committee meetings, working on bills and resolutions introduced in a session set aside for that purpose in early December. While several measures were introduced today, the real business of the legislature will begin in the several committees later this week. And tomorrow, we'll examine the first of the major issues facing this session, school financing and property tax relief. Ron Abernathy, TV40 News at the State Capitol. Well, Bob, we're glad to have you here. Another group of lawmakers will be meeting tomorrow, reconvening the United States Congress. And you know who's going to be there? That's yes. Hayakawa, as a freshman Our senator. Fresh, it's hard for me to think of uh, Senator Hayakawa as being a freshman, 70 years young. That's right. Actually, he's got two days on the job already. 
So he has some seniority there. As a matter of fact, uh, a $4 billion public works job bill is expected to be the first measure that they uh, send through Congress in Washington. One of the Democratic congressmen up there, uh, Robert Rowe of New Jersey, said he expects to have somewhere around uh, 125 co-sponsors on that particular measure to be the first one through. In some other news, arson is suspected as the cause of a fire that destroyed the administration building at Bakersfield High School early today. No one was injured in that blaze, but damage has been estimated now at some $850,000. Also lost were the records of the 2,750 students at Bakersfield High. About 4,000 California state workers got an extra day off today due to an explosion and fire that ripped through the state resources building basement in downtown Sacramento. The blast, which occurred about 5 p.m. on Sunday, damaged a transformer in that 16-story office building. Power was cut to 13 state buildings, eliminating electricity, elevator service, water, heat, and telephone communications for about an hour. Employees from the Department of Fish and Game, Parks and Recreations, and Water Resources received that extra day off. The Sacramento Municipal Utility District said that power should be restored to that building uh, totally by tomorrow. Well, one of the first labor strikes of the new year has begun in California with office workers and staff members picketing the California School Employees Associations. And while negotiations went on at CSEA headquarters in San Jose, workers picketed regional offices here in Sacramento on both J Street and Arden Way. The strikers are field representatives of thousands of school employees and are in effect striking against their own union. Reporter Maggie Skura has more on that story. The 150 striking field representatives would normally be working at negotiating new contracts and securing benefits for 90,000 workers in the nation's oldest and largest classified school employees union. The field representatives work for CSEA, but their own contract expired one year ago. Management requested an extension of the terms and the workers now feel that they've waited long enough to renegotiate for themselves. There's a built-in snag here, though. As long as the field representatives are on strike, contracts and salaries for the 90,000 school employees can't be negotiated. Their present contracts expire on July 1st. Field representative Bethel Winslow talks about the strikers' demands. We are striking for um, fringe benefits. They, uh, our association decided that they would not increase fringe benefits for us. They have decided uh, we will not have longevity anymore. Uh, our wages have not been what we asked for, and particularly, they just refuse to negotiate with us any, any longer uh, at the end of our contract time. They have said to you that the demands are too high to be met, or what? Right, and that's what we do when we go out to school districts. We uh, ask for good fringe benefits, longevity, good salaries for the employees, but we can't get our own union to give it to us. Whatever the outcome of the negotiations, the striking field representatives here hope for a quick end to them so that they can get back to where they say their hearts are, and that is with the 90,000 school employees that they represent, who for the first time this year are under a new collective bargaining law. This is Maggie Skura, TV40 News. In Oakland, the judge in the Wendy Yoshimura case has postponed his ruling on the defendant's motion for a mistrial. The judge, Martin Pulich, said that he wants to study some more cases before deciding on that particular question. The defense claims the prosecution prejudiced Ms. Yoshimura's case by mentioning the names of Patricia Hurst and her underground companions. I'm Richard McLaughlin. If you have an off-road vehicle, there are some new regulations you ought to know about. I'll have a story on that still to come on the TV40 10 o'clock news. This portion of TV40's 10 o'clock news brought to you by Sacramento Savings. This portion of TV40's 10 o'clock news brought to you by Rainbow Bread. 
And still to come this evening at 1022, Maggie will take her first look at our weather around us, which was a little wet, thank goodness. At 1027, our man Lincoln Ferber will have a report from Washington concerning the snag in plans for Puerto Rican statehood. Then at 1043, James Nelson will bring us up to date on the problems facing the state of Utah because of a lack of snow there. Larry? Well, as you might know, uh, State Senator Alan Robbins, a Los Angeles Democrat, is challenging Mayor Tom Bradley for the mayor of Los Angeles. And today, Robbins introduced a bill to place all major redevelopment projects in the state subject to voter approval. TV40's Don Gomez has that story. Last year, Senator Robbins authored a similar bill. It got to the governor's desk, but it was vetoed because of a provision that gave 1% of the voters the right to vote down large redevelopment projects. This year, 10% of the voters must say no in order to cancel out such projects. The focal point of the bill is the downtown Los Angeles area, which is part of a $500 million redevelopment project. Robbins says it will grant special tax exemption privileges to such skyscrapers as the Times Mirror Building, the Arco Towers, and others that he says don't need such special tax privileges. Robbins harshly criticized Los Angeles Mayor Tom Bradley for opposing the bill on the grounds that it's too complex for the voters to understand. There stands the mayor of Los Angeles, his pockets jammed with campaign contributions from the owners of these high-rise buildings that benefit from the redevelopment project, opposing right to vote, accusing me of unethical conduct because I stood firm for one thing, and there was only one thing I wanted on that last day of session, along with the other Senate conferees. We said, give us the right to vote give the people of Los Angeles the right to vote on the downtown redevelopment plan. Robbins calls his bill right to vote legislation. He says taxpayers should have the same right to vote down a redevelopment project as they do an education bond or any other such bill. He contends his bill has the support of both the Republican and Democratic Central Committees in Los Angeles. In any event, the legislation will affect only projects that are of $500 million or more. Don Gomez, TV 40 News. On January the 1st, many new state laws went into effect in California. Major revisions in the vehicle code covering off-road vehicles were among the list. TV 40's Richard McLaughlin has this report. The new section in the vehicle code applies to off-highway vehicles on lands other than a highway, which are open and accessible to the public except private property. Vehicles involved in the new law include motorcycles, snowmobiles, sand and dune buggies, or all-terrain vehicles and jeeps, as well as regularly registered vehicles when being used off the highway. California Highway Patrol Deputy Chief Lloyd Sellers told TV40 News that the new laws were needed for protection of property. Well, the need came about because of the tremendous expansion of the use of the off-highway vehicles throughout California. There's been a dramatic increase in the number of them being operated in the desert areas and the mountainous areas throughout California. How will, this, uh, how will these new laws in effect the off-road vehicle user? I think it'll give him type, some type of benchmark, uh, knowing what he can or cannot do. It'll make a uniform application of the laws applicable to off-highway vehicles and give the enforcement agency uh, something to work with. Infractions of the new law will result in fines. Reckless driving will result in fines, imprisonment, or both. Registration fees collected will be used to develop more off-road facilities and special local recreation projects. Richard McLaughlin, TV40 News. Inyo County Sheriff's deputies are searching for two young Southern Californians missing on a mountain hike near Bishop. The authorities say that 22-year-old Jerry Ann Grasmuke and 23-year-old Stephen Shepard, who were to have returned Sunday to their car at the North Lake Campground, failed to show up. Heavy snows hit that area over the weekend, hampering the search party's efforts. President-elect Jimmy Carter has reportedly invited former President Nixon to the January 12th inauguration in Washington. It's tradition to invite former presidents and their families, but there's been no real indication yet whether the Nixon will attend or not. Meanwhile, a, sp a spokeswoman for the inaugural committee denied a published report that Carter's staff members were somewhat fearful that Mr. Nixon would attend. She added that if the Nixons show up, they will be treated like any other first family in accordance with protocol. Larry? Well, as you might know, Griffin Bell is Jimmy Carter's choice to be Attorney General. Well, Bell was in the nation's capital today with a number of issues on his mind. And at the top of that list, according to Bell, was school busing something that Bell says should be used only in rare circumstances and as a last resort only. 
At a news conference attended by our correspondent in Washington, Marion Brewer, Bell urged instead of busing more integration in public housing. The Attorney General designate Griffin Bell believes we should integrate housing, not put the burden on children by busing them to achieve racial balance. There will be some cases where the, some school districts where uh, busing will be employed uh, as a last resort. I'm going to try to improve the educational process. That will be my number one priority, while at the same time according everyone the constitutional rights. The former federal appeals court judge told reporters he was interviewing people but wouldn't name those under consideration for top Justice Department jobs until he's been confirmed by the Senate. However, he said he has a candidate for Solicitor General and would make all selections on a merit basis without regard to race or sex. Bell was questioned on the subject of replacing FBI Director Clarence Kelly and he responded in this way. In the event a new director is selected, I'll, I'll do the selecting uh, subject to the in, in consultation with President Lake Carter. The Atlanta attorney posed for pictures with Attorney General Edward Levy this morning after they wrapped up a two and a half hour meeting. We talked about some of the some of the uh, pending uh, uh, cases, but not any not enough detail to warrant my comment on. Bell will be in Washington until Thursday, then he plans to return to Atlanta to continue his interviewing process. From the Justice Department, this is Marion Brewer reporting. And coming up in sports, Ken Gimlin says he has found the top teams in college football. We'll get him to elucidate in just a moment. This portion of the sports on TV 40's 10 o'clock news brought to you by Cornelius Buick Pontiac in Fairfield. That means that we talk right after the intro's over. That's, that's what it that's is. That's right. Okay. Elucidate. <laughs> yes. So, would you like to elucidate I about will the go ahead and fire away. Of course, if you're in Southern California, you might not want to hear what I have to say. But anyway, here it goes. UPI's college football poll was released today. Pittsburgh is that number one team. Really, no one was surprised. Pittsburgh, of course, wrapped up the championship Saturday by crushing Georgia in the Sugar Bowl. Southern Cal, the Trojans were second, followed by Michigan, Houston, and Ohio State. Well, here's a surprise. Former Nebraska running back and Heisman Trophy winner Johnny Rogers is signed with the San Diego Chargers. Rogers, of course, was San Diego's top draft pick in 73. He spent the last four years in the Canadian Football League. Well, the Oakland Raiders really seem to have put it all together this year. They won the AFC title, Mad Football's best record. I asked Coach John Mann if there is one player who surprised him at all this year. No, not really, uh, because this is a, a team thing, and our accomplishments are uh, team-oriented. And, uh, you know, to name any one player or one person would be totally unfair to, to all the other people and, and their accomplishments and their contributions. Because, uh, you know, to be a, a, a great team to, to get to and win a Super Bowl, you have to do everything well and everything right. You can't just... Uh, play well on defense or offense or special teams and neglect the others and therefore it takes every segment of football and every uh, person within the, each segment. 
the Atlanta Hawks of the NBA announcing today they have a brand new owner. Ted Turner is now Ted Turner is now the majority owner of that team. Just yesterday, Turner, the owner of the Atlanta Braves baseball team, was suspended by the baseball commissioner, Buey Kuhn, for tampering with former San Francisco giant outfielder Gary Matthews. Well, Philadelphia 76ers, they're a team filled with superstars. But they really haven't put it all together this year, so far that is. But yesterday, Philadelphia exhibited championship form as they crushed the Nets in New York. And TV40 Stuart Sato has this report. Julius Irving returned to the familiar surroundings of the Nassau Coliseum in New York yesterday. Only this time he was wearing a Philadelphia 76ers uniform. Dr. J scored 18 points, an average game for him, as the 76ers downed the Nets 139-110. to 110. The 76ers got a big game from Steve Mix with 24 points, while George McGinnis had 18 and Jimmy Jones and Henry Bibby added 16 each. Bibby gave the crowd in the Coliseum some excitement when he threw in a desperation half-court shot. The 76ers went on to win the game and maintain a one-game lead in the Atlantic Division of the NBA. This is Stuart Sato, TV40 Sports. Pro basketball won contest tonight in the NBA. San Antonio crushing Buffalo 142-109. Well, professional basketball salaries this year are astronomical. And I asked the Los Angeles Laker announcer and assistant general manager Chick Hearn if he felt these dollar figures would have a negative effect on the game. I definitely do. I think that uh, Philadelphia right now has got too big a payroll. There's no possible way that they could ever make a nickel in the next 50 years. Uh, I think all of us are going to have to take a little hitch at the belt buckle and calm things down. Now, a kid that uh, came in this year after the merger, Ken, uh, let's say Adrian Dantley of Buffalo. A year ago, he would have gotten a minimum of a million dollars for five years. This year, he got, uh, I'm just guessing, but I think I'm pretty close to the numbers, less than 500000 for five years. And so uh, it's starting to level off. But all the contracts that were made before have to be honored. And some of the contracts that were made by the ABA to lure players over there you can't believe them. I've read them. I've seen them. And if I had not seen them, I would not believe them. But, uh, of course, two players in our league are making a lot more money than anybody deserves. Uh, because no athlete, unless he's a ticket seller, as I call him, a guy like Rick Berry that sells tickets, you would come to see Rick play. You'd come to see Jabbar play. Other than that, in these two clubs, I doubt that there's a player that you would actually pay to see play. So ticket sellers are worth 100000 maybe, or more, but certainly not the astronomicals. Millions. We were bidding for Julius Irving. If we'd have got him, it would have cost us $7 million total. Total. Nobody's worth that. Well, in baseball, unfortunately, some bad news. Milwaukee Brewers receiving that news today. The Brewers ace relief pitcher Danny Fazella died in a dune buggy accident over the weekend. Fazella had a very impressive record with Milwaukee this year, five and two, and also nine saves for the campaign. Well, Larry, of course, we're going to be back with some sports. We're going to have some basketball, hockey, and some college basketball. All well, kind of goodies there for us tonight, right. huh? All right, and we'll be back with Maggie Skura's report of the weather in just a moment. This portion of the sports on TV40's 10 o'clock news brought to you by Cornelius Buick Pontiac in Fairfield. Maggie has the real big news for us tonight, and I think that is the fact that everybody's delighted about the rain and the snow and the other precipitation that we had. Right. In everybody is delighted, even yeah. though everybody was a little bit surprised that the, the weather forecast decided to revise itself over the weekend. Didn't we it, told, though? Yeah, we told you on Friday it was going to be sunny and fair throughout New Year's and New Year's Day, so you could watch the football games and then go outside and boogie or do whatever you wanted to. 
but it decided to take a turn. As you probably all noticed, we had 1.26 inches of rain in Sacramento, certainly the heaviest rainfall we've had all season long. We'll tell you a little bit more about what happened, but first, taking a look at what happened around the rest of the country today in the national satellite map. We can see that uh, there were dense layered clouds in the southeast and in the west, mostly middle and high level clouds were covering the western portions of the central and southern plains, while low clouds covered a large area from the eastern portions of the plains to Alabama and Michigan. Some snow cover is also visible over the northern plain states. And as we take a look back at the national map, we can show you what happened in a little more detail. The Pacific Northwest is reporting a little bit of a snow flurry today, 36 degrees behind Seattle, and partly cloudy skies and a little bit of snow as we said. Through California we did have some clouds and a few showers. Of course in the Sierra some snow still continuing, storm warnings continuing through parts of Nevada, Idaho, also Utah tonight. Travelers advisories are in effect but they should be diminishing and probably gone by tomorrow morning. Most of the southwest is uh, not too bad, pretty mild temperatures, 65 degrees in Phoenix, partly cloudy skies. It was snowing in Denver today with a high of 43 degrees. 47 Houston, Texas, through the Gulf states, we do have some partly cloudy skies. Temperatures are cool and a storm watch is in effect. We're expecting heavy snows throughout parts of the Midwest today from uh, Kansas through Indiana. Moving down to the farther south, uh, 80 degrees today in Miami Beach, Florida. The high in the nation, 81 degrees in Key West and West Palm Beach, Florida. Moving up the Atlantic coast, we have some partly cloudy skies. Temperatures are pretty mild until we get to Pennsylvania, where conditions are very slippery. Snow and ice and sleet and very dangerous driving there. New York City had a high of 29 degrees today under sunny skies. The Great Lakes areas, snow flurries and not too much exciting happening there. And the low in the nation, 25 degrees below zero in Bismarck, North Dakota. And to show you that we didn't have anything near that, we'll take a look at Northern California's high temperatures today. And you can see that Red Bluff reported a high of 55 degrees. It was 57 in Marysville, 62 in Sacramento today, 57 at Travis, 56 San Francisco, 57 Oakland, 57 Stockton, 54 Fresno, 28 the high in South Lake Tahoe, 44 in Reno. Truckee is missing, but it's there, but we just don't have the temperature. The temperature in Sacramento right now is 44 degrees, barometer 30.04, and it's rising slowly. And the forecast for the Sacramento Valley and vicinity, it's going to be um, partly cloudy tomorrow. Showers will end tonight and uh, continued cool temperatures with highs in the mid-40s to mid-50s. Lows will be in the 30s to 40s with local frost. For the San Joaquin Valley, showers will end tonight, partly cloudy through tomorrow, and then fair Tuesday night and Wednesday, a little bit cooler with highs in the upper 40s and 50s, lows in the 30s with local frost. For the Sierra Nevada, traveler's advisory for snow showers, heavy at times, gusty winds, that'll decrease tonight. The snow level is now about 3,000 feet. And tomorrow there will be some snow flurries, continued cool with highs in the 30s, lows about 15 to 20. And in the San Francisco Bay Area, partly cloudy tomorrow after showers, which will end tonight. Fair Tuesday night and Wednesday, and the highs will be in the 50s, lows mid-30s to 40s, and it will be a little windy in San Francisco. Mm. That's kind of good. Sounds nice. Yeah, some, um, a lot of the Sierra reported snow accumulations of up to three feet, which is not bad. Many places reporting good to excellent skiing for the first time. Yeah, they've been reporting that anyway, even on <laughs> man-made, uh, people-made right. snow. you got to try. Yeah, why not? You like this I like you do Florida, right? Oh, yes, certainly. I used to be out in California, and I'm glad to be back, especially when it snowed. Yes. Now, what else could he say? He's here. No, that's, right. that's great, Larry. And coming up in the news, we'll have details uh, concerning statehood for an American territory. And a large oil tanker is reported missing out in the Atlantic. The details as TV40's 10 o'clock news continues in just a moment.
The Ford administration's proposal for statehood for Puerto Rico may die just that, being just a proposal. There's every indication in Washington tonight that President-elect Jimmy Carter will not pursue the matter. And as correspondent Lincoln Ferber tells us, the ultimate decision on that question may rest with Mr. Carter. Press Secretary Ron Nessen says the president was making a serious proposal, not just a gesture with his call for Puerto Rican statehood. But the problem is there may not be enough time for the legislation to be drafted and sent to Congress before President Ford leaves office. Nessen said the Interior Department, which is drafting a bill, has found it to be quite a complicated subject. So it might be left to Jimmy Carter or some member of Congress to pursue it. And Carter has not been very enthusiastic about the idea, saying the initiative for statehood should come from Puerto Rico itself. In any case, Nessen said President Ford will continue to push the idea, either in his State of the Union message in the middle of this month or in a special message to Congress. Lincoln Ferber at the White House. Earlier, of course, the president-elect said that he favors retention of Puerto Rico as a territory. That's the way he feels about it. And it. some people on the island uh, want to keep it as a territory, and perhaps maybe we should let the people there make up their yeah. minds. And I think, I think uh, Mr. Carter alluded to that fact that he would like to see them, you know, vote on it and say what they would like. You know, All right. right. Well, Great Britain has been given approval to borrow up to $3,900,000,000 from the International Monetary Fund. That's over the next two years. You might know already that Great Britain, back in October, asked for the loan in an effort to bolster its already ailing economy. British negotiator Iwa Richard is in South Africa following meetings over the weekend with Prime Minister Ian Smith in Rhodesia. Today, Richard met for three hours with the South African Prime Minister to discuss the deadlock in the negotiations over the black takeover in neighboring Rhodesia. And after his weekend meetings with the Prime Minister Smith, Richard talked with our correspondent, Martin Bell. It was not unexpected. Uh, he obviously uh, was not uh, greatly enamored of the proposals that I brought. Uh, he has uh, not, I think, slammed the door and locked it. And we've agreed to meet again in about uh, oh, eight to 10 days time after I've had the opportunity of talking to the other parties involved. You know him, you know his mood. Do you think he can change his mind? I don't really think it is a question of changing his mind. Uh, I think it's a question of uh, his coming to believe that this is an acceptable interim government and indeed that the insertion of a British presence uh, into the interim government is the only way of giving the twin reassurances that are needed. One to the blacks that uh, uh, the process to majority rule will be irreversible, and one to the whites that it'll be peaceful. Um, he obviously finds the idea of a British presence unpalatable. Uh, I can only say that the British find the idea of a British presence fairly unpalatable too. Uh, it's not something that we're anxious to do. On the other hand, we do believe very firmly that it's the only way of squaring this very difficult circle uh, of uh, dealing with the, uh, the dilemma that emerged at Geneva. There is really still hope, is there? Yes, there's hope, indeed. The United States and Canadian Coast Guards tonight are searching for a missing oil tanker carrying 8 million gallons of crude oil. The Panamanian tanker, the Grand Zenith, was en route from England to Providence, Rhode Island when it disappeared last Thursday. That makes it five days overdue without a word. According to Coast Guard reports, the vessel was last reported about 30 miles south-southeast of Nova Scotia. President Ford's recent proposal to decontrol gasoline prices has naturally enough drawn fire on Capitol Hill. Five lawmakers call the proposal a lame duck political trick. Correspondent Bonnie Ginsberg has details. Gas prices will spiral by up to eight cents per gallon if President Ford goes through with his proposal to decontrol gasoline. Democratic Senator Henry Scoop Jackson said the president is playing dirty pool with the American people, and if there were any reason to decontrol gas, Ford should have done it before the election. I can't think of anything an outgoing president could do to throw a monkey wrench into the economic stabiliza stabilization efforts of the president-elect than at this last moment to come in and hit America where it hits everyone, right in the gasoline pocketbook. Administration officials say gas prices would only rise by a penny a gallon if decontrolled. But Senator Howard Metzenbaum of Ohio says a congressional study indicates otherwise or translated into cents per gallon at the gasoline pump, five cents to eight cents per gallon. 
I must say to you, I don't know whether the Federal Energy Administration projections are correct or whether the Congressional Research Service projections are correct. But in a situation in which there might be an economic impact of this great magnitude, there certainly is no such urgency. The Democratic legislators predicted a quick congressional veto of President Ford's gas price decontrol if he decides to go through with it. This is Bonnie Ginsburg reporting. Wall Street came into the new year close, but not quite close to the 1,000 mark. The Dow Jones Industrial Average closed the day off nearly five points in trading that was described as moderate. The analysts say that today's decline was the result of profit-taking from the market's strong advances that it made last month. And when all was said and done, the Dow Jones closed Jury selection began today in Aspen, Colorado, and the murder trial of singer-actress Claudine Langer. As you might know, Miss Langer is accused in the shooting death of her lover, professional skier Spider Savage. Seventy potential jurors are being questioned. Miss Langer was escorted to the courtroom today by her ex-husband, singer Andy Williams. Three days later than usual, the tuna boats chugged out of San Diego Harbor today. The tuna fishermen and captains are displeased about the new federal regulations governing their industry. They are, by law, no longer allowed to net porpoise, which usually swim with the yellowfin tuna. And because of this, most of the fishermen say they will be able to get about half the normal catch that they used to get. The tuna boat owners are appealing that ruling, of course, but that process could take several months. Larry? Officials say a 16-year-old youth has been arrested in connection with the death of a 22-year-old woodland woman. The body of Anna Propes was found along the roadside in northern Yolo County last night. The youth was arrested when he was seen driving the missing woman's car. In Washington, the Congressional Committee looking into the assassinations of John Kennedy and Martin Luther King face a crucial House vote tomorrow morning. Correspondent Bonnie Ginsberg reports the future of the committee rests on Tuesday's ballot. Under a little-known legislative procedure called unanimous consent, Congress will vote tomorrow whether or not to reconstitute the Assassinations Committee and to approve its controversy-sparking $13 million budget. All it takes is one congressman's objection and the motion is nixed. But if no one objects, then a simple majority is needed to approve the committee budget. If that fails, another vote will be taken a week from today, and a two-thirds majority is needed. And if that fails, the whole legislative process of reconstituting the committee must start over, and it could take months. But there's more at stake than meets the eye, because the temporary committee budget runs out January 10th, and many high-level investigators who quit jobs elsewhere to join the Assassination Committee will have to seek other work. Privately, Assassination Committee sources are saying the fate of the investigations hinge on tomorrow's vote. This is Bonnie Ginsburg on Capitol Hill. An oceanographer in Massachusetts says the millions of gallons of oil spilled from the Argo merchant may come back to haunt southern beaches some several years from now. 
Dr. Jerry Galt said the ocean currents may eventually bring that oil slick back close to the United States shoreline. Well, Bob, another ship, this one anchored in a Washington State Harbor, is making the news this evening. The battleship New Jersey, having seen action in three wars, could become the center of the world's biggest floating crap game. That is, if Atlantic City, New Jersey officials have their way. More from Karen Kaiser. Eight years ago, the battleship New Jersey served in the Vietnam War. In World War II, it carried a crew of 3,000 men. Now it sits here in Bremerton, waiting, decommissioned, and the state of New Jersey wants it. Well, it's not that the Navy doesn't want to give the ship to the state of New Jersey. It's that the, New Jer the battleship New Jersey is part of our mobilization fleet, and there's always a possibility that it would be called on to serve in the United States Navy again in the future. The Navy has only four battleships left. All are decommissioned. The New Jersey was the only one used in Vietnam. Four older and smaller battleships are now used as museums. That's what Atlantic City and other New Jersey towns would like to do. But when you get on uh, board one of those majestic ships and realize what a triumph of man's uh, uh, skill in making such enormous vessels uh, and the power and strength of them, uh, you uh, also get a kick out of it. And, and we think this is something worth preserving because nowadays, the battleships, of course, are not being any longer made. But someday in the future, it'll be decided by uh, chief of naval operations or even higher authority that the, uh, there'll never be a need for the battleship New Jersey in the U.S. Navy again. And at that time, uh, it'd be open for different organizations that might want the ship. And of course, the state of New Jersey would probably get the first crack at it. The Navy is protective of its ships. It wouldn't let us aboard the New Jersey, and if the state does get it eventually, the Navy will insist it be moored and maintained with the dignity she deserves. Well, while the Sierra may have had plenty of snow, there's not much snow in Utah, and we'll have a report on that as our news continues. Warm sunny days and clear blue skies may sound like an ideal weather forecaster for some, but not for ski buffs. To the ski operators either, particularly in parts of Utah, it has meant a disaster, the lack of snow. James Nelson reports on the situation there. Holding the lid on pollution and smoke in the valleys of the west. Reservoirs, which normally should be mostly full, are well down. But the most visible victims of the lack of snow have been ski resorts, which have lost millions. Here in the Park City area alone, the loss has been figured at almost half a million dollars a day. Most vacationers with reservations have canceled, but those who have come have found other things, like just sitting in the warm sun to occupy their time. I guess uh, I'd only be fooling myself if I said I wasn't disappointed. Um, I'm enjoying the nice weather, but of course I'd like to see some snow. So yeah, I am disappointed, but uh, I'm still enjoying Park City. I think it's a good way of life. People here in this. Beats New York. The Weather Bureau estimates these mountains would normally have between three and four feet of snow on them by now, instead of five to six inches. Here in Utah, the ski resorts have asked that the region be declared a disaster area to allow resort owners to apply for federal disaster loans. Also, $25,000 has been set aside from the governor's emergency fund to pay for cloud seeding. A specially equipped aircraft was standing by at the Salt Lake International Airport waiting for the first real snow clouds. When the first storm impulse came late last weekend, the seating paid off. Three to four inches fell on the resorts. Not enough to ski on, but resort owners say a start in the right direction. More snow is expected tomorrow, and it could end what skiers and weather bureau people are saying is the longest snow drought in history. This is James Nelson reporting at a ski resort near Salt Lake City, Utah. Ah, but up in the Sierra, it was a beautiful story. It was. Yes. I wanted to go up yesterday and just watch it snow. 
but uh, okay. I didn't have any chains, you and I didn't, uh, didn't feel like chains or chasing tires. Chains. You can get by with either one. Can you use snow tires now? Yeah, you can uh, on four-wheel vehicles. That's right. When I left California a few years ago, you couldn't do that. Right. Couldn't use those spike things either. Enough. So far, we haven't had to worry about it too much. But that's uh, right. But now it's coming, so that's good. And the operators up there, ski resort operators. Are Pretty well pleased. Yeah. Well, Ken, you might be interested in knowing. Hey, I, I oh, we that. wanted to come back to California real bad. <laughs> Let me tell you, I said, oh, I'm going to be disappointed because first few weeks I'm not going to have time to go skiing. Be too busy. Well, certainly now we're going to have skiing. Of course, the last few weeks, even if you wanted to go skiing, unfortunately you couldn't. But I'm going to keep right. my fingers crossed that we'll have a lot more. Of course, I enjoy skiing, and uh, if you haven't had a chance, you should get up. Couldn't be a sportscaster without skiing, I don't That's guess. for sure. <laughs> At least if I don't break my leg, I'm okay. Here's somebody that did come up with uh, kind of a problem, Larry. The New York Nets of the NBA, of course, had double trouble in yesterday's loss to Philadelphia. Not only did the Nets lose the game, but they lost their star guard, Nate Archibald. Despite his size, Nate is one of the top players in the NBA. Archibald had scored five points when he drove in from the right side after shooting the ball. His right foot landed on that of Julius Irving. He stayed in the game for a short time, but he was forced to come out minutes later. X-ray showing that Archibald, unfortunately, had fractured his foot. He'll be lost to the Nets from three to six weeks. Well, the Western Basketball Association is now non-existent this year. Sacramento prospectors will have to be content in just playing in tournaments. And TV40 Sports asked Coach Richie Williams if this presented any problems to his team. Well, first of all, uh, Jim, it, uh, it's very disappointing not only to me but uh, a number of the ball players because they were kind of depending on the league to get some exposure uh, towards the pros, etc. For me personally, it presents a problem in terms of discipline and uh, the incentive to, to really compete at a high level because uh, really in an exhibition schedule there's nothing to win except uh, the pride in having a winning record. You know, so um, like I can tell the difference in my past practices the past couple of weeks uh, because some of the fellows have been coming in a little late. Whereas before when we had the incentive of the league, the guys were at practice half an hour early, they were really enthused. And um, uh, that's about the biggest problem I see as far as I'm concerned. A rather unique marathon was held yesterday in Rome, one in which even dogs took part in it. Max Harwood has this report. Place each year on the first Sunday after New Year, so the competitors can have up to a week to get over the festivities. This year it came the day after New Year, but more than 4,000 Romans made sure they were there for the start. It's a far cry from the ancient chariot races and the gladiatorial encounters, but it still has its surprises. And it's a contest for man and beast, with three dogs taking part. It's run over a course of a little more than 42 kilometres. This represents the standard marathon distance of 26 miles, 385 yards. There's a halfway mark for those competitors who run out of breath in the first stage of the marathon and want to call it off there. Winning is not as important as completing the journey. There are no prizes for the winners, but everyone gets a poster for taking part. Some consolation, I suppose, for the sweat and the effort that they put in. And a National Hockey League action tonight. One final, actually just one game. Montreal 6, Philadelphia 4 in college basketball tonight. Six-ranked Kentucky turning back Georgia in overtime 64-59. to It was Marquette 63 and Georgia Tech 45. So, Larry, that'll kind of wrap it up tonight. And we had Monday with, well, a little bit going on in sports. It was a busy Monday. Mondays yes. are quite often busy in sports. Yeah, well, of course, particularly with the weekends, you have, of course, a lot of sports going on. So Monday's kind of a day where you kind of recap things and find out what's going to happen during the week. And uh, everybody wonders and right. remembers and talks about the mistakes. All right, we'll be back to find out all about the weather from Maggie Skura in a moment. Okay, that's where the weather begins in the west. It moves right. toward the east. 
That's very good. You taught me that. <laughs> Did I? <laughs> yes. I didn't know that. Yeah, we were talking about California a few seconds ago when you all weren't looking. And uh, this weekend we had some kind of weather all over northern and southern California. We've had rain and snow, thunder showers, and uh, high winds and a little bit of everything. Didn't they had some problems down in Los Angeles because of the rain, some uh, flooding yeah. and, and yeah. mudslides and that's stuff? That's right. Yeah. Did. But that's all stopped now. We're going to have some partly cloudy skies for us tomorrow and for Los Angeles as well. We're going to take a look at what happened around the rest of the west today as all we right. look at the uh, regional satellite map. And you can see a storm centered over the borders of Nevada, Idaho, and Utah, and that's producing cloudy skies with areas of rain or snow over the interior of the western United States, and it's also causing some locally heavy precipitation. You can see along a uh, you can see that precipitation, by the way, along a frontal system, which is extending southward from the storm through Utah and Arizona. Showers are accompanying a southeastward moving upper level disturbance, which is right there near the northern California border. We'll look at some high temperatures reported around the Pacific coast today. Seattle, Washington had a high of 36 degrees with some snow flurries today. 36 in Portland as well, 56 degrees in San Francisco, and 64 degrees today in Los Angeles. In Sacramento, we had a high of 62 degrees. We'll look at some other temperatures around the west to compare and see how everyone else did. Great Falls, Montana reported a high of 12. That's Pretty low high for Great Falls. 32 degrees today in Boise, 39 in Cheyenne, 43 today at Denver, 44 in Salt Lake City, 44 as well in Reno, 65 degrees in Phoenix, and 44 degrees in Albuquerque, New Mexico. In Sacramento right now, it's 44 degrees. The forecast for the Sacramento Valley and vicinity for the next couple of days, it looks pretty fair. I don't know if that's good or it's partly good and partly bad. The showers will end early tonight. And then will be partly cloudy tomorrow and continued cool with highs in the mid-40s to mid-50s, lows in the 30s to 40s. There will be some local frost. San Joaquin Valley showers ending tonight, partly cloudy tomorrow, and then fair Tuesday and Wednesday. Highs will be in the upper 40s and 50s, lows in the 30s with local frost. The Sierra Nevada is uh, going to be canceling the traveler's advisory later tonight. Snow showers would be heavy at times and gusty winds. Snow level about 3,000 feet. It will be partly cloudy tomorrow with snow flurries and continued cool. Highs in the 30s, lows about 15 to 20. And in the San Francisco Bay Area, partly cloudy tomorrow after the showers end this evening. Fair Tuesday night and Wednesday with the highs in the 50s, lows in the mid-30s to mid-40s. Had a little white out there for a minute like. with all the snow. Yes. Uh, we could use a little more snow and rain, though, couldn't we? We certainly yeah. could. We are uh, still way behind yeah. what we should be. And... Um, People were saying as much as 30 inches would be not enough rain even to, to catch up for this year and last year. Mm -hmm. So we have a long way to go. A lot of catching up to do. And Maggie, I didn't know until the other day, all these western states that you yes, show us. are our cable viewing right. areas. That's we right. are actually on the cable in 13 different western states. That's marvelous. You know that? I didn't know People that. in Dodge City, <laughs> Kansas are probably watching our show right now. Hello, Dodge City, Kansas. Well, as we all know, Many aspire to run the fastest, jump the highest, or leap the longest. However, in New York this week, a group of modern-day immortals gathered to put their mark in what's become the record book of the hip. And Rosemary Van Camp reports. Here he is, folks, Ronald Champlain of Pawtucket, Rhode Island. He sleeps on a bed of nails and he allows cement blocks to be smashed on his throat. Put one hand over my face. Watch my face. Go. Go. Well, it's fear, and it had nothing to fear or to fear but fear itself. That's your heart. That's my heart, and I have the right to do what I want to do with it. And I say it can do just about anything. But aren't you hurt? You're bleeding. Am I hurt? No, ma'am. You're bleeding. Am I? Oh, I'm going to fire the gun. You the two-hand message. No. Very close. That was Bob, the fastest gun alive. He pulled the gun out of the holster, cocked it, shot it, and returned it in two one-hundredths of a second. This is the great Cardee. He holds the record for getting out of a straitjacket in 12 seconds, a record which was established here. All right, Dave, anytime you're ready, Mr. Bohm will give the downbeat for this new world's record attempt. Are you ready? Ready, get set, go. Now approaching six minutes. Six seconds. Six seconds. Six seconds. So you got a world record. 
You're obviously a Scot. Uh, do you consider this a big success today? Yes, very much so. Uh, this is the first time that Guinness, in their new exhibit halls, has decided to get behind world record holders and invite them to come here and break records. And we're going to be doing, to everybody out there, we're going to be doing this more often, so most people who are world record conscious, this is the place to break the world records, believe me. At the Guinness Exhibit Hall in the Empire State Building is the place to be. Do you know, Mr. Lewis Sant of Fall River, Massachusetts, holds the world's record for haircutting. 200 continuous hours of hairstyling. Why does he do it? Well, he says he's celebrity conscious. He wanted to become well known. And not only that, after his picture appeared in the Guinness Book of World Records, his business increased by 75%. Well, we should uh, thank Denny Moore, who has filled in in this position while we we're putting together the new show, which has been several months in the making. <laughs> That's right, like our uh, opening was 35 hours in the making. Did you know that? Really? No. It takes a long time to do this kind of It took quite a bit of time. That's right. Yeah. Better thank Denny's this. wife That's for right. having a baby. That's right. That's Before we get off that subject. subject. Nine and, months uh, in the making. It Very certainly was. Nice. In fact, lacking four days, I do believe, <laughs> okay. if you want to be more, more exact. And Denny Moore's wife, Gwen, did have a baby girl. Baby girl. Oh, on, on Denny's birthday. Which is highly it's unusual, it's right? Very strange. What I don't know what the odds are for that. Mm. But have to call Jimmy the Greek probably yeah. to find out. <laughs> well, nevertheless, congratulations to them. And we promised, Denny, tomorrow night we're going to have some film of that new baby. And we're going to show it right here on our show. And we're glad to have you. Bob Whitman on our I'm show. I'm very glad to be here with all of you. Maggie, right. Ken, well, welcome. Larry, yeah, that's right. thank you very much. It's, it's going to be fun. It sure is. It's a long-lasting relationship, and we, uh, yes, I hope the ratings show up well, and uh, <laughs> we stick around for some time to come. And that's our news for this evening, the 10 o'clock news for the T240 News team. This is Larry Camp. Good evening. Starting Monday, January the 10th, Marcus Welby with Robert Young at 7... The FBI with Ephraim Zimbalist at 11. Marcus Welby at 7. The FBI at 11. Starting this coming Monday, January 10th.